first, I just want to note that deaf people have been excluded from the treaty, and I, I was hoping that maybe Michael uh, O'Leary could talk about this, because what, what we've been told by people, without mentioning who, who's told us this, they told us that the MPA had a red line that if we didn't remove audiovisual works from the treaty, that uh, uh, it would be the U.S. would not support the treaty. And so in the negotiations, there was a bit of a back pushback where we said, okay, well, first of all, I'll, I'll say my mother is deaf. And I, I, I talked to her yesterday, uh, Mother's Day. I, I talked to her in a service where I call up and somebody transcribes what I say to her. So she gets that on some little screen. I can't actually talk to my mother on the phone and have her hear anything I say. And, uh, and, and that's that's that's... That, that's my relationship with my mom. So when I talk about people being deaf and things, even though we, we don't push it completely all the time, I'm not really one to just say it's unimportant uh, that that the possibility of extending the treaty to deaf people is something that's been opposed. Because I, if I look at a lot of laws that are done on captioning, we have a, a lawyer right now uh, who's been looking at this in European laws. A lot of countries do provide in, you know, either in the communications laws or in, 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 in uh, copyright laws in different countries, some idea that you can you can caption things or you can do things to make some works more accessible for deaf people. But just sort of stepping back from that and hoping that NBA can address this issue a little bit. Um, uh, uh, I want to talk about audiovisual works as they apply not to deaf people but to blind people. And I, I, Richard Stahl, when I talked to this, he said, well, that's crazy. Uh, blind people would never have a reason to look at an audiovisual work, and because they can't see, and 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 I said, well, really, if you look at distance education, what's happening right now is you have a lot of video delivered coursework, uh, and Mano, who's in the other room, uh, she used to work in distance education professionally. She worked at uh, she worked in research and development for for Litz and then and then this Kellogg thing on technology, and then she was hired by SIC to, to implement distance education in in Malaysia seven years ago, and we sort of got interested in it at the time. And, but a typical distance education module might have a video with PowerPoint slides in it, with figures and stuff like that. And actually, to make that, and, and those works are used for professional education. Uh, they're used for lawyers that are here right now to get, get your like CL credits and stuff like that. Uh, it's, uh, people are using it to, to tell you how to fix your sink. I mean, there's a lot of different things where video is used in, 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 in informal and more formal training. And things like that. So we so we suggested language in the treaty that would say that audiovisual works could be included to the extent that the audiovisual work was to be adopted to make it more accessible to someone who was blind or visually impaired for purposes of education or training, because those are the things that we were most focused on, and we were sort of a, kind of not even at that point even arguing about whether deaf people should be included in the agreement. And that has been very difficult to do. And I don't think that should be very difficult to do. Uh, and I think that right now, the World Blind Union has agreed uh, to, to walk away from that issue because they're being beat up so bad on these other issues that they've just kind of given up on that issue. And I think you're going to do one treaty, and this treaty is going to be the one treaty that blind people are going to have, or people with disabilities are going to go, and you're going to leave out the group look rapidly fastest growing platform for education. And I just don't see why you think that's really a responsible thing to do. And it's really because of the motion picture industry, which has like zero stake in these training and education materials, is just basically taking a hard line on this. Okay, I, I get it that if you don't want Ghostbusters or something like that included in the treaty, fine, I, I think that's one thing. But to, to, to exclude distance education materials and training materials isn't like really a minor issue, in my opinion. It's a big uh, thing that's been left off the table. Um, on the three-step test, we have this uh, memo from the uh, publishers, which was released by, on Friday by the uh, international by the IPO office in the UK. Um, it goes on and on about it, but uh, uh, but they talk about the three-step test and, and the fair use issue. But uh, as far as the three-step yeah, test is, ask, I don't. Know that any of us have seen it, so well, you haven't seen that. You could send it. Sure, you should subscribe to uh, our access to knowledge. <laughs> <laughs> you see these things, but uh, the UK office sent it to the World Blind Union actually uh, from our website, so that was good. But it was uh, uh, Joseph. I mean, uh, Glenn Moody is a journalist in the UK. In April, submitted a FOIA request 
to the IPO uh, in, in the UK, and he asked for correspondence with the publishers, and then they, on Friday, I just got, I, I saw this randomly, I was doing a, a, a Google search for some other document, and this popped up on Monday, it was actually released, I mean, on Friday, it was released on Friday, and uh, it's 28 pages of, of, of documents between the UK publishers and the UK IPL, and they have a couple of documents, I'm sure you haven't seen it, that, are, that were written up, uh, one was uh, on fair use, one was on commercial availability, and there was a third one, so there's like these three briefing documents that they have, which were, were I think, quite useful for us uh, to, to look at. But on the three-step test, on the one hand, we hear the publishers say that, uh, that the three-step test is some sacred thing that uh, is part of our DNA, and Moses left it off by mistake when he did the Ten Commandments, and it's really, you know, like, you know, you, you would go to hell if you didn't, like, recite it in your sleep or something like that. Uh, and it's with you, and you can't do anything about it, and that ship has sailed, and it's, it was all decided 40 years ago. That's sort of one story. And the other story is, oh my God, if you don't put it in the tree of the line in a particular way, it'll disappear. So, like, what is it? Is the three-step test actually some albatross around everyone that lives and legislates copyright exceptions that you just already lost that thing and it was negotiated away in 1967 or you know whatever the date is? Or is it something that can actually disappear tomorrow if it's not in a treaty for blind people? I mean, I think there's a bit of a, a contradiction right there. And it, it, it's our position that the three-step test is plastered all over certain agreements, certain free trade agreements, it's in NAFTA, it's in the, uh, it's in, uh, it, it, it's, it's in Article 10 of the Berne Convention, it's referred to in, our, in, 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 uh, in Article 13 or whatever in the TRIPS, it's in different agreements, but it, it doesn't really extend to everything, and some issues about its implementation are, are quite important. What we've made a big point about is that exceptions in the Berne Convention, which are not subject to the three-step test, the so-called particular exceptions, they cover education, quotation, news of the day, public affairs, lots of other issues, uh, uh, even some things on sound recordings and things like that. That those things have a, their own standards, which are not the three-step test, but they're different standards, and the, or there's no standard at all. Like the quote, uh, like the, uh, the news of the day is an absolute exception in, in the burn. It's, it's a mandatory thing, and then. You know, the education thing would be like uh, uh, fair practice or just extent justified by the purpose. It has this other standard. My point is that, is that the U.S. fair use law probably survives a WTO test because a lot of what goes under the, what, what constitutes fair use would find an exception in the burn in those 11 or 12 different unique exceptions they have, which are just completely typical things that we call fair use. So if it's an educational context, it's going to benefit from the Article 10 provisions or Article 9. I, I, I'm probably getting it wrong. There's, you know, there's an article in the burn on, on the education <coughs> exception. If it's a question of quotation, news of the day, public affairs, things like that, they have their own special exceptions. So what we see playing out in this agreement is not do you reinterpret the three-step test, but do you do you have a massive negotiation about the three-step test and all these super complicated, sophisticated, you know, obscure things? And so there's a provision, uh, a general provision that's proposed to which is one sentence that says that this treaty doesn't change any other treaty obligations. And Alan knows what it is, and other people have looked at this, they know what that agreement is. Now, we, we just think, like, why does just this one sentence provision that says it doesn't change any obligations you have in other agreements, why don't you just do that? Because the minute you, you have a full page of language about the three-step test, you have a full page of stuff to argue about, and it's crazy now. The language that came out of February referred to three agreements, of which they misquoted two. They changed the wording of the TRIPS agreement to go from right owners to, uh, to, 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 to authors, which was, not in the trips, which was not in the TRIPS agreement. In the WCT, they quoted the three-step test without the agreed-upon statement, which protected the burn exceptions and it broadened it. And so it was kind of a weird edit. I mean, like, it's one thing if you want to quote what the other things. And also, if you pull out the quotes, it's complicated. Take, for example, the TRIPS. The TRIPS has a three-step test. It also has Article 6 on the first sale doctrine, which is not subject to dispute resolution. It has a provision on control of anti-competitive practice. It was Article 40. It has Article 7. It has Article 8 on things like technology transfer and stuff like that. It has 
uh, in, in public interest and, 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 and things like that. It has Article 1. It has all these other articles, all of which like disappear when you just pull out the favorite part of the TRIPS that the publishers want. So it, it isn't really the same as saying the TRIPS agreement applies and everything in the TRIPS agreement in its proper kind. It's just like pulling language out. So that's why people get all their back up on this. Well, you don't want to like repeat the entire TRIPS agreement in the Treaty for the Blind. You don't want to and do the whole WCT or you know all these other agreements. What you need to say is that this agreement passed on this day doesn't derog doesn't doesn't change the rights or benefits that that publishers or or blind people have in other treaties that that, that exist. Right? Finding the right non-derogation language. Non-derogation language. And then why would say that reinterpretate? The three-step test is because the European Union dumped all this three-step test after February. In February, there wasn't this three-step problem. In the February, I mean, in the June 2011 text, as most people know, it was about seven pages long. It had like one bracket. It was maybe four words in dispute. It was a very clean text, much preferable in our opinion, in, in like 99% of the cases to anything that you're negotiating right now. It was really a pretty good-looking text. That thing didn't get into this stuff, and then and then then the EU started asking to have all this three-step test, and then retaliation. Then Venezuela puts in this reinterpretation things as a bargaining chip to try and get the bad three-step things. So now you've got three-step mania. You had five days of negotiation of the three-step test in February. You have the MPA and the patent owners beating up on the U.S. government to abandon the deal that they made in February, and then you have the U.S. government demarching countries to get rid of all the fair use language, which was what you had to put in to get the three-step test. So here's what's going on. If you want to relitigate the three-step test, then you have to relitigate all the fair, fair, the fair practices, fair use stuff. Everybody's unhappy. Everyone's going to kill each other. And you're going to have, like, billions of brackets, and you might not have a treaty at all. And it's just completely unnecessary, because, frankly, this is a crazy place to litigate the three-step test. This is free for blind people. It should be, you know, seven pages or one page. It should be really short, and it should be really clear that you don't move the ball to the left or the right, front or center. It just, you know, basically, it only changes what it changes. It just changes these exceptions. Um, those are my, those are my <laughs> comments. I wanted to make sure I got out. Um, and I apologize for uh, 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 raising my voice. Um, but.